Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Turner, and I'm a doctoral student at the University of Toronto, the Department for the Study of Religion, and it is my great honor and privilege to uh, moderate at this, the 106th event in the Social Science Baha Lecture Series. Now, before I introduce our speaker for today, I would just like to remind everyone to uh, turn off your cell phones, um, as if we were at the Mall Cinema, and not disrupt the event. Uh, that we are to enjoy. Um, our speaker for today is Christian Lutzenitz. Uh, Dr. Lutzenitz is the David L. Snellgrove Senior Lecturer in Tibetan and Buddhist Art at the Department of the History of Art and Archaeology, School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. His research focuses on Buddhist art of India and Tibet, in particular Gandharan and early Western Himalayan art the latter largely based on extensive field research and documentation done in situ. Dr. Lutzenitz has also held visiting professorships at UC Berkeley um, in 2004-2005, Freeman, at Free University in Berlin, 2006-2008, and at Stanford University and UC Berkeley, Renata, in the first half of 2010. Before joining SOAS, he was senior curator at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York. He has since led an AHRC-funded research project on, quote, Tibetan Buddhist monastery collections today. Uh, everyone, can please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lutzenitz. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Thanks also for the, the uh, hosting this uh, talk today. Uh, which I think is more than overdue, uh, given the fact that uh, I'm working on collections in Mustang since 10 years now. <laughs> and so I think it's high time to actually present some of that work here uh, in Kathmandu. Uh, the topic of today is a brief history of Logeka Monastery. And uh, in this case, I focus on the history on the basis of the art that is preserved and that I can connect to historical personages and uh, in this way can reconstruct the, the development of, of the monastery as it is uh, preserved today. And what we see on the screen is some of the oldest art that is preserved uh, at this particular place. Uh, Lokeka is, of course, well known as the oldest monastery of Mustang. Uh, and it's located uh, not far from Tsarang in the side valley uh, of the Kalikandaki River. Uh, we see it in the uh, kind of the lower pin of the upper, <laughs> upper uh, cluster of pins, and just north of it is Lomantang. And uh, its uh, kind of status or high status of, uh, as the earliest monastery of Mustang comes from a, a famous uh, text, a terma, that uh, describes the, the life story of Padmasambhava, the, the Pemakatang. And uh, in the Pemakatang it is said that Lokeka, the Naga of Lokeka, had to be tamed before Sambhi could have been built. And so it precedes the first monastery in Tibet, uh, according to that uh, legend, or we, we can't necessarily take it as a, as a historical fact, but what we can take as a historical fact is that the place at that time of, of the discovery of the term 
which uh, has been uh, revealed by Eugen Lingba. Uh, so in the 14th century, the place must have had an important role already. Uh, the description is interesting insofar as well, as it makes clear that there was a tower at the place uh, to be built uh, by Padma Sambhava and uh, that the surrounding with the springs are part of the holy territory. And that of course is what you experience or experienced until recently when you visited Logeka. Unfortunately, they now started to build a, a wall around the complex. But it's a complex surrounded by springs and then by this uh, set of 108 stupas. Of course, what we find in terms of the mon monastic complex today uh, is obviously not that old. <laughs> uh, and uh, it has been changed uh, many, many times. And part of these changes will be uh, kind of the focus of uh, this lecture. Uh, for that, I can, uh, for the architecture, I can rely on, on these plans by John Harrison. Uh, and in the upper plan here, we see the, the cross section through the actual temple uh, with the, the sanctum in the back and the assembly hall in the front, and then an upper room above the sanctum that is also a temple. Uh, and uh, we see elements from these uh, in, uh, during the lecture. And I think what is also important in that connection is the ground plan, because the ground plan gives us the, an idea that the, 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 the story of the tower is probably <laughs> at, at evidence uh, in the architecture itself, because you have an amazingly thick wall <laughs> surrounding the sanctum and the way it's constructed its additional support walls that come in uh, also indicates that there is a kind of more massive structure that, or, or a higher structure that was supposed to be carried by uh, that uh, foundation. Probably the oldest kind of art history historical work that is preserved is a stone relief panel that has been inserted in one of the side walls of Logica. Yeah. It's obviously very hard to date <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, style. It doesn't give away uh, too much. Uh, it's worshipped as Tada, but obviously more likely represents Avalokiteshvara uh, as it's more likely male uh, than female. We'll see the lotus flower and the balada mudra, the, the, the gesture of giving, uh, quite clearly. But this image is, of course, uh, specially worshipped by the vis visitors. Another element that uh, these locals credit to the actual foundation of, of the monument is the triad of images that is on the main wall of the sanctum, namely, uh, Padmasambhava flanked by uh, the two consorts. But we'll see from the colors and the state of restoration that it has been changed often. And so it's very hard to tell how old the sculpture actually uh, is. Uh, but at the very end, we'll, we'll see what this latest phase of the sculpture dates to. Logeka is probably also famous for visitors and fairly unique for the region uh, for its uh, stone panels. And so besides the, the, the murals that are found in the sanctum, all the other temples in the monument uh, actually have, well, are decorated with stone panels of different kind of iconographic programs. Here we'll see the 84 Mahasiddhas assembled in one corner of the assembly hall. And uh, here we'll have uh, Padma Sambhava and his 25 disciples as they are represented on the main wall in the upper chapel. Yeah? And, and together with the peaceful and wrathful deities of the Bado, which occupy the side walls uh, in that particular chapel. 
what we also see here, of course, is that the painting is new. <laughs> These are modern colors, uh, and they kind of obscure the age in some, to some extent. It's also, since these stone panels can easily be moved and have been moved many times, they're very difficult to date. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, we have some views uh, how uh, they can be dated. My kind of first estimate was in simply 17th century on the basis of stone panels in Ladakh in Hemis Monastery that shows the 84 Mahasiddhas and that dates to that uh, time period, but that was merely a guess. Uh, but there is more uh, to it. So I, I'll uh, get to the monastery of Logekal uh, in through essentially two projects, or from the perspective of two projects. One is my own uh, project on Tibetan Buddhist monastery collections today. And in the course of this project, I do inventories for monasteries of everything that is portable, so that they have evidence that they actually owned that piece uh, in case it gets lost, but also that they learn maybe some more of, of the history of that object, because very often that is lost as well. Uh, and in the course of that project, in 2014, I also documented the stone panels of most, except uh, the most interesting rooms of uh, Lok uh, And in this case, I documented them in situ within the frames, so it's a kind of yeah, documentation that is not ideal because you uh, don't see uh, necessarily, you can't photograph them with uh, the light at an angle enough that the relief comes out. Uh, properly and that you can judge the relief, which is very important because the, the, of the paintings uh, that covers them. Uh, and part of the project, uh, or the first book length product of that project is, is this publication that you may have seen on um, the two text collections in Namgil Monastery. And we are currently working on another uh, book covering the sculptures of that monastery. Uh, since the airport has asked about it. So we, you can take a look if you don't know it yet. Uh, later on, these date to the 14th century. Uh, and it's, uh, the, this is also available as a, a PDF file online, uh, especially for easy search of the text <laughs> that are cataloged within it as well. Uh, the other project uh, that uh, kind of brought, brought me again uh, to Lake Logeka is the seismic strengthening and restoration of Logeka financed by the American Embassy and led by the, by the Nobusum Foundation, which is a kind of new, fairly new foundation dedicated to uh, the heritage of uh, Mustang and the surrounding regions. Uh, the project had a planning phase in uh, 2021. Uh, this April, it started uh, the actual restoration work, and uh, by next year, it will be uh, concluded. And the actual restoration work that started this April gave me the opportunity to document at least some of the stone panels uh, fully in detail because they uh, are being moved from one room to the other or the floor of the, the, the upper sanctum has been, has been changed so the panels have to be taken out. So these are now fully documented from front and back and with the required uh, details. And in particular, there are Lokiteshvara panels, one of which we see here, uh, kind of turned out to be quite crucial uh, for the understanding of the monastery. So we'll start looking at the murals first uh, in the sanctum. Uh, these were cleaned by the American Himalayan Foundation when they did a restoration project 20 years ago. And I think on one picture you can see a patch of the original uh, dark darkening of the, of the murals. These are uh, yeah, fairly good quality uh, murals. 
and uh, the restoration project also kind of initiated, uh, kind of me to look at them more carefully that happened last year to try to understand the iconography and what was actually meant uh, with that program. And that project is ongoing because I don't know the source of it. <laughs> Uh, one can understand it to a large extent. So here, for example, we have a, have a form of uh, Vajrabani, but the unusual element about this Vajrabani is that in the second arm, he holds a hook. Yeah? And uh, actually there are five of these crotas that hold hooks <laughs> in the second arm. Uh, four of them hold different attributes. Uh, here, for example, a sword. And Green, of course, that's the Karma family of Buddha Amogasiddhi, who is also green. And so the, these five uh, represent the five Buddhas, and they are distributed uh, as uh, on the screen here, uh, the orange ones being the five. Yeah? And so you have on the main wall essentially two forms of Vajrabani, but one is white. <coughs> But instead of the wheel of Vajrayana that we would expect, he also holds a Vajra. <laughs> While uh, then the others actually hold the respective family attributes, the, the lotus, the jewel, and the sword for the Karma family. Uh, the organization is also slightly unusual because it's not according to the direction. <laughs> and so in, in a certain way, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite puzzling how to read it and what the choice was, why uh, they were arranged in that way. Uh, but the entire remaining iconographic, or almost the entire remaining iconographic uh, program of the temple then consists of essentially repeated representations of the same protectors in smaller size uh, in, in, in those colors. And what I still haven't figured out is what the source of this iconography is. It's, it's clearly Nima, it's probably Therma, but I don't know which one. <laughs> so if you have any idea, let me know. Uh, of course, from, from first appearance, we would say as art historians, that's probably 18th century paintings. Uh, I guess you would agree with me. Uh, but So I was accordingly quite surprised uh, to find that there is actually a restoration happening <laughs> in the mid-18th century. Yeah? And that restoration distinguished itself from the original murals by painting the same deities on canvas. And if you look carefully on these uh, two pieces of canvas, at the very top there is a little llama represented. And that actually gives us a clue about the tape because the Lama can be identified as Katowicz in Seven Norbu, who was active, uh, yeah, especially in the mid-18th uh, century in Musta. Yeah? And sculptures of him or, or paintings of him are found throughout Musta. And they are quite distinctive because of this quite distinctive head with the green sides, also a slightly different shape of the usual Nyingma hat and uh, a vest that is also green, partially at least, uh, if it's painted. And so we find his portraits in many places, uh, but one particularly important one is the one in the Tsaran Palace, because it's inscribed. It gives both the identity of the, of the figure, as well as the identity of the artist, and we come back uh, to that uh, at the end of, towards the end of the talk. So we know now that the murals must be earlier. Presumably they weren't, uh, it wasn't necessarily immediately to restore them. So if you guess uh, stylistically, they probably won't be much earlier than the 17th century. So mid 17th century would be a good uh, kind of estimate for those paintings. And that is confirmed by another uh, kind of group of evidence that is uh, the, what I call the papier-mâché uh, sculptures paint, uh, done by a, a particular master who uh, obviously was extremely accomplished in making these sculptures. When I say papier-mâché, I want to point out that 
I have no idea what the material actually is. Uh, there are quite a number of different materials that are similar <laughs> uh, or, or that are actually quite different but have this very thin uh, kind of shell, uh, very lightweight and I think research into those different materials and technologies used in Mustang would be very interesting and they ch seem to change over time. Uh, so it's, it's a, a kind of summary term that I use here uh, in absence of actual uh, technological research. Uh, but from those sculptures we have, that probably are from the same kind of master artist, we have uh, one Lama portrait and the eight manifestations of Shatna Sambhava. And it's the Lama portrait that is very important because it's an, another uh, clue in terms of date. Uh, and this Lama is a certain Narak Prince of uh, who visited Mustang in uh, one year only, and that is 1651. <laughs> and he is a very important uh, figure for the history of Sikkim, because he was one of the four major, uh, or four Lamas who came together to uh, 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 reveal the Payul of Sikkim and essentially create the Buddhist kingdom of Sikkim. Yeah. And he's the founder of Dashitin Monastery. And of course, this portrait, as we have it here, that probably dates fairly close to his visit, <laughs> is much more precise than any portrait of the Lama that is preserved in Sikkim today, uh, as far as we can see. And it is distinctive because of the dress of the Lama. Yeah. If you look at the, the, the lower garment that he wears, he has these three strings that hold the garment, yeah? and that is distinctive enough so that I can tell that the bronze is the same lamp, and it's the bronze and the inscription on the bronze that allowed uh, the identification of the lama because the clay sculpture doesn't actually give one, and we know now there are uh, two other sculptures in Mustang, one we already documented, the second one we still have to and uh, the bronze sculpture is interesting uh, as well because it makes clear that this image has been uh, essentially made by the then Mustami king uh, and his Ladakhi wife uh, in the mid, uh, must have been shortly after uh, his visit in 1651 and I Think what, what I like particularly and is quite unusual about this inscription uh, that in the, it says, May I, along with my court, be endowed with a long life free of disease, authority, prosperity, perfection, and the Holy Dharma. But it doesn't actually, it's quite unusual in the sense that it, this is mostly yeah, secular aims. There is no religious aim expressed. And that is very unusual for inscriptions of that type. And I think it has a lot to do that, that, uh, with the fact that Nyanak Prince of Rikzin was also of royal descent, uh, namely West Tibetan royal descent. And uh, it's this royal connection that seems to have played a role uh, in his uh, kind of special veneration here in Mustang, and maybe in the dedication of this particular image. Yeah, I already mentioned he visited uh, Mustang in, in 1651 and the king at that time is Agun Sandu Grapten and his wife is Nida Gyalmo and she is uh, from Ladakh as I mentioned and the same donors are for example uh, Nida Gyalmo especially is, is responsible for this particular image uh, that is today in the uh, Pritzker collection and that has been donated in or, or made by a Neva artist in commemoration or, or as a gong talk, as a, as a commemorative uh, object uh, uh, for Agun Santo Prakta. So he must have had died at, at that time. And that's important in relation to the panel of uh, Logeka again. Uh, it's also unusual that we have the, the uh, name of the artist uh, maybe constructible, reconstructable from the Tibetan Sutra Chotri, 
uh, sounds a bit uh, unusual, but that's what uh, seems to be the most uh, close random. Uh, and yeah, and, and the style is of course unusual because it copies the Kashmiri poems uh, of the 8th century. And it has actually been published as an 8th century Kashmiri poems, but I think it's, it's uh, an even copy of that. And then you have the eight manifestations, and I call him the Papiermaché master, simply because all these eight manifestations look quite different. <laughs> Uh, and there's quite a lot of variation in uh, the, the uh, representation. And I think the, the best Tibetan artists were known for variation in, in their styles, for being able to uh, kind of work in different styles at the same time, or with the same accomplishment. We also have two Lama portraits on the top of the murals. Uh, but I can't identify them. I mean, it, it's unlikely that this is Nadak Prinzokritzin, but nevertheless, I think the sculpture of Nadak Prinzokritzin seems to indicate that the, the murals probably come from the same time, uh, approximately, even if uh, he is not to be identified as such. So this April, then, I had a chance to look at the or document. Uh, panels that I hadn't documented earlier, namely the stone panels in the Avalokiteshvara temple. And these are uh, inscribed, and they suddenly give us a, a completely different level of historical position for the monument. Uh, this is in the old Avalokiteshvara temple. They will be moved into a new room, and that gave the occasion to actually document them in detail. We have seen that picture already. And each of them is inscribed and dated. And one of the things you can do in the evenings then is trying to figure out what the dates actually are and how <laughs> and, and to whom they actually refer to. And so what we have on the screen here are the two earliest of those panels. And I actually am surprised that I haven't found anybody talking about these panels earlier because much of the inscriptions were visible before. But these panels uh, essentially commemorate the performance of uh, the recitation of the Mani Mantra a hundred million times, <laughs> uh, a so-called Mani Dungjua. And, and so at the occasion, within the same year, yes? and these recitations were financed by uh, different donors, and the donors I mentioned, so you have, for example, on this one, you have uh, Yungjok, uh, so, so the, the, the uh, queen mother, so to speak, uh, Nida Kermo, who uh, is the donor. It's qualified as a Gongjok, which means it's in commemoration after her death. So suddenly we know her death date. <laughs> it must have been the year before. Uh, and she probably initiated that tradition because it's the first panel that is uh, dedicated to her. There is another panel 10 or 11 years after that is dedicated to her. The second 10 panel is dedicated to her husband, uh, probably retrospectively. Uh, and so, so in this case, yeah, uh, the date uh, may not directly refer to the date of, of the king as we have the Britsker bronze that uh, seems to indicate that uh, he died earlier than the queen. And so it just doesn't work together. Uh, the panels are also unusual as they give some of the carvers that are, and the first two actually are two different covers, Benda Gyalpo and Namka uh, uh, both uh, at some panels then had uh, kind of qualified insofar as they, uh, it is said that they come from a village called Surkhan, and it's very clear that they are essentially different covers from the same workshop uh, that they learned uh, together. Uh, these two panels are extremely close to each other, and Surkhan itself is a village near D, uh, and it seems from there that the artists come from. 
A third carver is mentioned, a carver called Lavang, uh, at a slightly later date, but probably still from the same workshop. But then there is a kind of break in the way the panels are done, first in iconography with some unusual representations of our location uh, in these panels, and then also in carving uh, technique uh, with a more deeply carved relief uh, for the later panels. So it's the, there's clearly a change of school of carvers. And that is, of course, uh, important because I hope in future work I can use this kind of different carving styles to at least find out or give a relative chronology to the other stone panels uh, that we'll have uh, at the site. And so we'll have here the years from 1680 to 1716, uh, we have almost every year panel. Yeah? And, and, and the continuous chronology of panels. And uh, they contain quite a number of historical facts, mostly related to the, the royal house, uh, but also to a certain Miban Bintok uh, uh, Drukbalama, who obviously was very active in Mustang and about whom we hear more and who uh, must have died in, in 1711. We have uh, yeah, the dates of the death of Niedergjernmo, for example. We have uh, some supporting evidence about the different relationships with the historical texts within the royal house. Uh, it also confirms, for example, the, the death of Bünzig Rapten, the first son of Hagen Sandburg Rapten. Uh, who is a monk, but is called essentially Dharma Raja in the inscription, which kind of confused me for a while. We have noble ladies that are mentioned, uh, which are much harder to date because they are hardly mentioned in, anywhere in the, in the historical sources, so more research is needed on those. Another group of... Uh, so, so what they documented is that the entire reconstruction that we have today is essentially royal support. And that, that they also uh, seem to have financed the presence of, of prominent lamas at the site uh, during that time. Uh, and as I said earlier, I want to, on one hand, the, the panels change place. And these are panels were in, in uh, the Gönkan, so with the protectors together, but in an arrangement that it wasn't original anymore. Uh, so in this case, the different size and iconography also allows to reconstruct the, the original display uh, as it was planned. And uh, during the restoration, that we will be displayed in that original uh, form again. So let's get now get to Mipa uh, Bitsok Sherap, about whom we have uh, heard already. And he obviously was a very prominent figure because I find him in many places uh, during the work on monastery collections. And uh, some of them are important. And of course, he is also represented in the Geka. And it's, it seems quite clear from the sculpture itself that this doesn't belong to the same master artist of the earlier sculptures. <laughs> yeah? But it's obviously not much later because uh, uh, Mipam Shedda Pünzog must have been active in Mustang already in the at least late 1680s uh, as kind of preceptor of the, the then Mustang King. Yeah? And we find evidence of his activities in Mustang in different places. Uh, the comparative painting is from Gilling Monastery. We also see he is quite dressed and has the yogic band of uh, he has the yogic band. So he's clearly not the Sakya, but he's a Drukpa Lama. And he's a prominent uh, Drukpa school uh, teacher. And we see his portraits on uh, Tzatzas as well, that are inscribed and identify him. Uh, and on this particular painting, that actually shows uh, 
die de, uh, Lama Prinzok Tsukien Norbu, who is uh, from the, a prince from the royal house and later had to leave the monastery to, to take on the royal succession. Yeah? And also marry the Ladaki queen. Uh, but originally it was a monk and uh, in this particular painting, the uh, Bibam Shera Prinzok is clearly represented right above him. So he is the root guru of the Sakya Lama. So what we see here in this early representation is that there is a clear, a less strict understanding of the different relationships of the different schools to each other, yeah? uh, and, and a much greater intermingling. Uh, and of course, the prominence of the Lama at Logeka also explains why in the old temple of Tsalang, we actually have a, a, a Drukpa lineage representation with that Lama in the center, yeah? which always puzzled me in a Sakya monument. Yeah? On the other side, you have the Sakya lineage uh, represented. And more recently, I noticed that one of the manuscripts uh, that uh, contains teachings of Mipam Shera Prinzok actually was printed in Lomantan and the block prints are still found in the Children Monastery Museum, at least a part of that. Uh, and so I think there is still quite a lot of work to do to see if there is more kind of historical information related to Logika found in his writings. Uh, definitely the personages that in the carvings receive teachings from him. And so there is already a connection just through the titles of his uh, collected works. So then I have a, a kind of final piece uh, that now leads into the kind of mid to third quarter of the 18th century, namely uh, an artist called Bern Sitar, or Sritar, uh, who is or whose work is documented now unusually in a document issued by the Mustangi king uh, to, to essentially you know, uh, assign privileges to the artist and his family. Yeah? But in the course of that, uh, his different works that he has done are listed. And among other works that are listed, is the restoration of Lugeka and actually a, a pentad of images at Lugeka. But the main images today are a triad, not a pentad. <laughs> so one of the things I will do now when I go back to Akumustang is to check if there is evidence for more images <laughs> to the side of it. Uh, because it seems very likely uh, from that particular source and then think about what these additional images could have been. It also mentions the mural restoration that we already could date through Katowicz in Sebon Norbu. Yeah. It also mentions another triad of Padma Sambhava that is today in the Gami Palace. And it's uh, the comparison of Padma Sambhava of this triad with the image at Logeka that actually convinces me that it is indeed the same artist, even if the Logeka image is repainted. There are peculiarities, especially the way this kind of triangle is formed between the, the eyebrows and uh, this kind of prominent chin that are quite characteristic for that artist. And there may be more uh, to find, uh, to identify him. So another goal is, of course, to uh, kind of find more of these images mentioned in the document, especially those in Lomadang, which we haven't seen yet. But the triad in the Tsarang Palace is also mentioned among them. Uh, and here we can see essentially the same elements, but in a slightly reduced form, since these are not yeah, semi wrathful uh, facial expressions. Uh, sorry that this is German at the bottom. <laughs> That's from the translation of Dieter Schuh, uh, who published the document. 
and it essentially uh, identifies the three sculptures that we have represented here, two of them with inscriptions on the sculptures themselves that conform <laughs> to that fact. Yeah, so you have real cross-reference here. Of course, we can't date them precisely, but we now know that it's definitely prior to 1783, and uh, yeah, so it's probably they date to somewhere in, in, in the third quarter of the 18th century. And we know that his, this is a prominent uh, artist at the time. Of course, Lokeka was changed continuously after that as well. Uh, but luckily, those parts that we saw now, uh, not at least uh, structurally, but the structure as we have it is actually a much changed uh, structure, among others, uh, the architects we were working with uh, found evidence that originally the temple was entered from the side where the arrow is and not from the front and that the entire front part where we have the square around or the rectangle around uh, is a newer part in the architecture and that is of course confirmed by the murals which are even younger uh, and these are obviously with modern colors and are the most recent additions uh, to the, the iconographic program of the temple. Uh, it's also clear that the stone panels uh, paintings are very recent and on some of them were, uh, it's clear that they were actually painted already when they were already in their new frames which also from their paintings are fairly recent. <laughs> and so on, on uh, that panel you can actually see the older color scheme on the side that was covered by the frame uh, and where you see a little bit more of the relief. Sadly the new painting covers most of the relief. It's a very thick layer and it actually makes it quite unclear. Uh, yeah, And that makes it of course a challenge for uh, researching these panels in terms of the both you know, exact representation of the figures but, and, and uh, stylistic assessment. But in the end, I think it's surprising how much of the history of the monument can be re-established by simply looking more carefully at uh, what is preserved at the site itself and being able to link it to the different collections that are preserved. Uh, in other monuments uh, surrounding the site. Yeah? And that is of course what I hope that the monastery collection project will allow more broadly and it already kind of succeeds with those prominent Lama figures that are also found in monasteries that I haven't shown. <laughs> For each of them I think one could do a separate lecture. And so what but, uh, yeah, and so, so these images then tie it into the local history of, of Mustang and uh, they also mutually reinforce the, the, the chronology that one can create about uh, Logica itself. So, so I hope in uh, future work I can kind of refine that further, be more precise with the dates, but uh, how precise one can be, we will see. Thank you. At this point, I will uh, open up the floor to questions for Dr. Tinnitz, and uh, I'll ask you first, before you give your uh, question, to just introduce yourself. This place, how far is it from the border and Kerala, Kerala and the Roman time? Is it south of that? Well, how far south? And is, uh, is it near where Ikai Kawaguchi, the Japanese uh, yeah. Buddhist, was, was, was he ever at this place? Does he write about this? Uh, not that I know of. Kawaguchi was, of course, resident in Marfa. Uh, so that's south of Johnson Airport. Uh, let me bring the map. And then 
another thing is, wait, I don't know, I'll answer this first. Uh, so on the map, in the very south, you see Johnson, yeah? And then uh, the first pin on the top, the lowest pin on the top is Lodeka. The further things are Namgyel and Lomantan. Uh, but the border would be beyond the picture. <laughs> so it's about 20 kilometers, I think, from at least, or, or maybe more than 20 kilometers. What interests me is this area of uh, Upper Mustang. Most of the monasteries are belong to the Sakya, Sakya order, and not, not too many in Nyingma. And uh, how do you explain this? Is it possible to explain this? Why, why is it this particular monastery is in Nyingma? Yeah, there, there, there is, of course, on the one hand, I think uh, it's already explained by the story around Lokeka because it's associated with Padmasambhava. And so it must have been a fairly early place in the 14th century already associated with the Nyingmas before the Sakyas established themselves in Mustang because that only happened in the 15th century with Murchen. And so the Nyingmas actually precede uh, the, the Sakyas or the prominence of, of the Sakyas in uh, Mustang. There is also the question of some of the early representations like uh, the Luri cave, for example, uh, if those lamas are actually Sakya lamas, but I think we can exclude that. Despite the fact that they wear a red hat, they are probably some form of Kagyu. <laughs> and so it seems in the early period there were actually different schools prominent, but the merchants and the engagement of subsequent abbots of Mor changed uh, the picture of, of uh, Mustang in, in terms of religious denomination and gave prominence to the Sakya, but in particular to the more sub-school of the Sakya. Yeah? And uh, the Nyingmas, interestingly, had a revival in the 17th century. And it's, there's clear evidence here with Lokeka that the royal house in Upper Mustang supported the Nyingma school, but supported kind of Lamas cross sectarian. Yeah? And then we see in the monuments where you have Sakya Lamas and lineages and Chukpa lineages, or in Lokeka where you have a prominent Nyingma Lama as well, and a, a prominent Chukpa resident, for example. And so I think it was more about kind of uh, the re religious charisma of the personage that, that was decisive in, in, in those cases than the school. And some of these tendencies we can see today, of course, as well. That if somebody is very charismatic, he has a much better kind of influence uh, in the region. And so I think the, yeah, and then in, even in Lower Mustang, uh, the Nimas were very much supported in the 17th and early 18th century. And it's very interesting to see this in relation to what happens in Tibet at that time, because there it's the same. It's the fifth Dalai Lama essentially, you know, takes up Nyingma teachings, supports the foundation of Mindraling, and actually in the text that, that the Mustang Lamas are, are kind of uh, described in, in that context, there is clear this relationship to central Tibet. Yeah? And so it's not surprising that the royal houses at that time kind of supported Nyingma school uh, lamas. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the picture is actually quite complex overall. <laughs> Any other question? Please. We, we need to hear you. <laughs> uh, my, qu my question about the panels. Introduce. Oh, no. yeah. Shireen from the Green College. Um, this scheme where they, were, they knew they were going to add a panel each year for the commemoration. So there's no paintings on the wall behind. But does that mean that the, that shrine also was, probably could only be dated to 1680? Yeah, we don't actually know how the panels were used at the beginning. They were not in that so-called Avalokiteshvara temple originally, 
uh, when we took the frame apart and when I, I kind of documented them from the back as well, it was very clear that some had, of these panels had been mutilated to actually fit them into those frames. And so that was a later development. Uh, usually it didn't kind of affect the inscription or, or the, the image itself, but I, my feeling is that they, they were rather kind of differently shaped, maybe, roughly shaped, and we saw some of the, the kind of trapezoid uh, panels, and probably were just lined up somewhere, <laughs> rather than kind of worshipped in a temple separately. And do the locals know where they get their state from today? Where they get? The stone. The stone. Uh, <laughs> you do you want to answer no. that? <laughs> uh, there is a place called Dagmar. They got all this like nice ones. Yeah, from Dagmar. Yeah. So so it's it's supposed to be from Dagmar, but what I'm what I'm puzzled about is when the covers are from Surkan, <laughs> why are they from there? And was there is there a possibility around Surkan that you can actually harvest this slate? Uh, it would be interesting to know, otherwise it would just be a carving tradition. It doesn't look like uh, that is the area where, where those slates would be. Please. Hello. Um, is there, uh, is, I'm sorry, is there a lacking in uh, central feminine character in the images that we just saw. The lacking of? A feminine character. Uh, uh, to be specific, Tara? Abs absolutely. <laughs> uh, there is definitely a lack of that. Uh, the, yeah, as, as I said, the stone panel is actually worshipped as Tara, even if it's hardly recognizable as female. Uh, and that may kind of try to make up for that. We have the concerts of Patmasambhava, of course, uh, but there is hardly any female imagery, yeah. Yeah, especially at uh, Lodeca, but in other places there is. Just yeah. the first one that was? Yeah, just the first one, the early stone battle. Otherwise, there is, uh, as far as I recall, there is nothing. Yeah. But there is a lot of evidence for female donorship. And obviously, Nida Gelmo was very important. There were noble ladies, at least two, no, at least three that are mentioned in the panels that supported uh, the, the recitations at Lokekal. So they played an important role, but it's really in the background. Is um, I was I was interested in, in what look at maybe Eastern the photos is quite thick frames and as you say often the painting at the being put in the frame particularly in lieu of, of what begin as you say with a very low relief and they do develop into something a bit more rounded. I'm wondering if, if in part of positioning this there's any sense of how light would have played in terms of creating those of now they're quite heavily painted. But thinking of model forms, uh, can we construct it all with how either natural light or through devotional lights, um, light would have played in sort of the aesthetic of, of the monastery? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought much about it. But I think it's fairly clear that the reliefs themselves, when they are not as uh, kind of brightly painted, and when the relief is more apparent, they actually would come out nicely in kind of devotion and light, in a way. And that probably was a, an important effect at the time that distinguished them from, from murals as such. Uh, but even the, the murals themselves were clearly kind of created with that in mind with all the gilding that obviously would reflect uh, back from flickering uh, light. Yeah. And in that sense, of course, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those uh, <laughs> sad elements that became uh, prominent. Oops, sorry. 
today is, is to introduce all these, these kind of class frames. <laughs> That, that, that really, it's very interesting because in Ladakh they take them out again right now. <laughs> they did it like 15 years ago or 20 or 30 years ago partially and they take them out again because they damage a lot <laughs> uh, in the end and they take away from the impact of, of the, the images themselves. But here they were fairly recently introduced, I think 2015 or something like that. Uh, I think after my first uh, documentation at the site, uh, definitely, yeah. So, so it's an in interesting element. And then of course you have very little kind of access to, <laughs> yeah. You uh, showed us the uh, murals, uh, which uh, date back to maybe three, three, four hundred years uh, ago. Uh, we live in a very uh, seismically active uh, part of the world, and these are uh, murals painted on uh, mud, uh, on walls built by mud. Uh, so, you know, how how often do you think in your in your, in your uh, reckoning? that these murals have been uh, redone, retouched, or done all over again. And obviously, they kept the original uh, dates there, uh, but how, how original are these paintings uh, going back uh, centuries? Yeah, I actually think there is not that much done to them. Uh, I think that they largely have been untouched uh, from the outset. Uh, until the cleaning that was done 20 years ago. Uh, but what you see throughout is damages. Damages through cracks. You see the one crack uh, here, which obviously is, is probably from an earthquake. Uh, there are also damages on when you view the temple on, on, the, on the right side wall that is clearly moisture damage. And that's also the, the side of the wall that has the most restorations, so they must have had a moisture problem. This is very common, especially in the lower parts of the paintings, that if moisture enters the wall, the painting is not retained. And that's, I think, also maybe the reason for the solution to paint it on canvas instead. But it also must have been a new technology at that time, uh, because gluing to the wall then uh, is necessary. And uh, but you see on the black patch on this one, you see the little black patch on, on the, the the picture between the two small protectors. That's the original appearance uh, in, before it was cleaned. So essentially, it was probably and, and many of these places were more, mostly black. So, so you couldn't actually see that much of the, the murals uh, before they were cleaned again. And of course they were blackened by the suit of the butter lamps. Uh, and, but the suit of course protects them <laughs> in, in a way. Yeah, it doesn't, in, 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 in certain ways it protects them. What I'm not entirely sure is how careful the, the cleaning was. Uh, we know from other cases that sometimes things are over cleaned, but I think in this case it looks quite uh, okay. Uh, but if, because the shadings are usually yeah, preserved, nicely preserved, I don't see any obvious damages in this case. Yes, yeah, so I think it's stunning. Some of these murals go back many, many hundreds of years, almost unchanged, and that's actually peculiar for the Himalayas. And I, I worked specifically in the Western Himalayas, and there we have monuments that until the archaeological survey of India touched them, went back to the mid-11th century, practically untouched, except in places where they were damaged in between. Uh, and 12th century, we have a few 
early 13th century and so on. Yeah. So it's quite stunning. It, it, it all really depends on the, the architecture itself. Uh, and in this case, I think the, the, the architecture suffered from earthquake anyway because it was a tower. And that tower probably collapsed. <laughs> And it's only the lowest floor that is preserved, because even the upper floor above it is a new construction and is not uh, part of that original structure. or um, all of them are the same, or an additional question to that would be um, where do they source it from? Yeah, uh, so I actually remember that I didn't answer the previous com question completely because the architecture in the lower part is stone. It's not much uh, wall as, as usual, but or as more, more common, but it's actually a stone structure that is the lowest floor. Uh, and so in terms of the painting materials, I think it's mostly uh, the, the usual kind of mineral colors that you get at the time. And with what is usually animal or plant glue that is used. And these seem to be very, very durable. Uh, usually paints were sourced by the donors. Uh, they bought them from because it depended on the money that you could afford uh, and give to the painter uh, that, that you could source the material. In many cases, yeah, so, so it, it's, we haven't done a, or well, I have no access to a painting analysis as such uh, about the particular pigments that were used in this case, but it shouldn't be very different from any other kind of traditional early monument in the Himalayan region. And of course we know, for, for example, in the earliest Western Himalaya uh, paintings, they actually used quite a bit of lapis lazuli that disappears because it has to come from Afghanistan. <laughs> but, but otherwise, like oil pigment and, uh, and vermilion and so on, those seem to be sourceable. Uh, it's very hard to tell where they actually come from. And maybe future research with kind of trace elements can show that I have no idea. Uh, but it would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, any last questions before we bring our event to the close today? Oh, they, they just moved to another room, uh, essentially uh, in front, on the same floor, in front of the, the, the upper sanctum, like if uh, I can show you on the plan. Oh no, we don't actually have the... So essentially, there are stone panels above here, and above these two rooms, there are two more rooms. Oops, you don't see that yet. Uh, so you, s you see the main room, yeah? And, and on the, the, the left side, along the left side, there are two rooms. And above that, there are two more rooms of this approximately the same size. And one will be used for the arts, and the one above the money wheels will be used for the other dish uh, these were originally, I think, 
done as retreat rooms because one of the functions of Lokeka is tempor as a temporary retreat place. Yeah? And so part of what we did with the planning the restoration is bring the, the sacred section <laughs> and the, the living section, separate them again and bring the sacred elements together on, in the, into the temple building itself because they were quite mixed up. So, so the, the, the Gurkhan, for example, with the art panels is essentially above the entrance to the caretaker's quarters and the Avalokiteshvara temple was kind of to the side of the main sanctum and was also a retreat place at the same time. This is why it wasn't accessible, or it's not all, or was not always accessible. Yeah. And the other intention, of course, then is to allow the reconstruction of the original display. And uh, with the Avalokiteshvara panels, we actually want to show them in chronology. Uh, so you can essentially follow the history uh, across them and you get descriptions and who donated what. And I think we uh, kind of locating it just above the, the money wheels is actually a nice place for them. Thank you for all of those questions and contributions. Um, at this point, I would like to thank Dr. Lutzenitz for not only today's pre uh, presentation, but the, the Tibetan Buddhist Monastery Collections Project as a whole. And I wish him a very productive uh, next few months of, of research and look forward to con hearing about the continuation of this work. And um, so first of all, a round of applause for uh, Dr. Lutzenitz, please. On behalf of Social Science Baja, I'd also like to uh, offer you a small token of our appreciation for today's event. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all of you for coming this evening. Uh,